Uh, welcome to our panel discussion, roundtable panel discussion on um, the, the effects of the pandemic and war on international exchange programs. Uh, we have here Mary Ellen Schmieder, who used to be the president of the Fulbright and executive director of the Fulbright Association. Mary Ellen helped um, me give the, was the per, per principal person as president, giving the Fulbright Prize for International Understanding to German Chancellor Merkel. We have Mal Grzada Wonikowska, who is the head of a prominent Polish think tank in um, Warsaw. We have Rika Zamer Kenyi, I'm, I'm mangling your name, I'm sorry, uh, who is the former uh, ambassador of Hungary to the United Nations and now is involved in important work here in Washington. United States. United States. United yeah. States. Did I say United Nations? United States, yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> and did I, now I, we, we also have uh, Milan Wojcik, who is, um, we, he does reporting for Poland's prominent daily newspaper, Gazeta Wyborska. We just learned a moment ago that he's also been, has written important bills for the Pearl Polish parliament. Um, bills that I think are really uh, germane to uh, modern society. And if he wants to, we can talk about that. But I was, I'm really impressed by the work that Milan did. I've, I've loan him for, for a little over a year. So I, I think we should start with Milan. Milan brings a student perspective uh, because he is right currently a student in Amsterdam, a student perspective to the issues of international exchange as well as pandemic and war. We'll, we'll get to all of the rest of these. The other panelists, by the way, Benedict Brisch, who was on our live session this morning, can't come on this afternoon. He's head of DAD, the German Academic Exchange Service for North America. He has served in Russia on behalf of DAD, uh, so he knows something about it. And if we can do this, we'll include him in this discussion post facto um, for the public uh, airing on YouTube. So Milan, why don't you go, uh, why don't you begin? Okay. So uh, I would like to touch upon the topics of maybe first how the pandemic influenced students who are either at university yeah, doing their bachelor's or applying. So as probably most of you know, almost every uh, university around the world, uh, in Poland, in Europe, in the United States, experienced a uh, some kind of a modification of their admission procedure uh, because of the pandemic be a large uptick of students applying, which in consequence means that it's harder to get in because the number of places hasn't grown in line with the number of students who uh, decided to apply. Um, uh, and this of course resulted in a lot of stress for students. This resulted in the admissions thresholds being higher and the competition being more, more fierce. And over the last two years, uh, we had in most schools in most countries on the planet, I think it's fair to say, uh, online classes, which was also had its advantages. It brought some innovations. Uh, it forced some of the more conservative schools to open themselves up for online learning, but it also, you know, increased depression among students. It increased anxiety, uh, antisocial behavior because people were, um, disconnected from their peers. Um, so in many ways, this was a, a really, already a really difficult time. And this year we hope that since the COVID, the vaccination program has, you know, successfully concluded in many countries and many people were vaccinated, a great percentage of the populations of, of the biggest countries on earth, that this year will be a good year for international and domestic students, but this has not proven to be the case. Um, and of course, the reason for that is the war in Ukraine. For a student like me, uh, it has two faces. So <clears throat> Poland, as you may not be aware, is not a country in the Eurozone. So whenever I want to, whenever my parents send me money in that I will spend here in the Netherlands, which is in the Eurozone, they send me in, in Zlotys. And as Poland is a country on the border of Ukraine, <laughs> uh, so it borders a war zone and there are bombs falling in literally 15 kilometers outside uh, our biggest city, Lublin, uh, one of our biggest cities, Lublin. Um, the currency exchange rates vary 
vary a lot, vary day by day. And we end up paying probably, it's fair to say, <laughs> 3 to 6% premium just because we have our, our national currency and the exchange rates uh, fluctuate very highly. Um, so this, of course, increases the costs for those on the very bottom who can barely afford the studies. In addition, and this is uh, a problem that that's is shocking many people in Poland because this is not this this hasn't used to be the case during the last thirty years. The influx of almost three million additional people to Poland and many more to other countries like Hungary, which I know also experience relatively to its size a huge influx of refugees, causes the housing market to be very fierce and very competitive. And again, this hurts mostly people on the very uh, low end of society, many times students who, of course, most in most cases aren't very wealthy uh, and contributes to high rent prices, high competition for to rent something. For example, where I am in Amsterdam, there is a huge housing crisis and basically uh, for every accommodation offer, there are a number of uh, people competing to get it. Uh, and this causes the owners to, for example, do a casting for the person who they will rent flat on or, you know, on the more serious and criminal side, it also happens that creepy men would offer women, you know, accommodation in exchange for sexual favors. So this uh, disruptions in the market are having huge and devastating consequences for many and lead to even in the most, uh, you know, outlandish cases, uh, the rise in criminal activity and, um, have hurt to some possible victims. So it definitely isn't easy to study in the time of the war and the pandemic. The costs are uh, through the roof compared to, to the previous years. Uh, there is also anxiety among the teachers um, who, because among all, I, I only listed the problem that I am facing, but people in, in the Netherlands are also facing uh, with the inflation problem, but it's also very much the case in Poland where inflation is two times higher, but there is a multitude of problems created by the war and by the pandemic and the combination of those problems, inflation, housing market, uh, falling currency rates, um, create a very hostile environment for students, uh, especially those that are not wealthy. Wow. So that, that, that's it for me. That's it for you. I just I just had to unmute my microphone because I don't want background noises to mm. hear. Uh, thank you so much. That's it. It is a, a different perspective than uh, what we've heard because you do have a different point of view uh, because being a student and it's important that we heard this. Astonishing. Who would like to go next? Uh, would would uh, Mel Gazzardo, Would you like to go next? Oh. Uh. Thank you. Thank you for, for having me. Actually, I um, I run a think tank, but I'm also a professor at Warsaw University. So I have my own experience in teaching during pandemic and teaching at the time of war. Uh, we have negative and positive aspects of this whole situation. Among negative aspects, I agree with Milan. There is a lot of stress also about uh, among the teachers. Um, there is a lot of um, uh, effort where teachers have to change the way of teaching, the content they had to during pandemic adapt very quickly into the online um, ways of teaching, which were in my country, Poland, it wasn't really very popular before pandemic started. There were tools, but uh, no one wanted to use them actually, and especially those who are teaching for many, many years. There is a technical barrier also, or rather say there was, because pandemic left us with no choice. So one positive um, and negative element was this whole transition. It was a lot of stress, but for the whole system, it was a very positive transition. And by the way, even in now when pandemic is limited, uh, almost over, we still keep online teaching at least partially. Some, uh, some universities decided to go for, you know, uh, hybrid um, uh, hybrid curricula, meaning that lectures are um, 
online and uh, exercises are in the class, for example. Then the, the other positive um, um, consequence was definitely that uh, uh, countries um, other than the United States or the UK, which definitely dominate the education market with a very large offer in English, uh, now can be supplied by other, um, other countries who um, have now a, a lot more to offer in mm -hmm. English. And also being online, they can offer and they can also use the opportunity to cooperate with the other universities all over the globe. This is an incredible chance for all of us to connect because the distance doesn't matter. And online during pandemic, it was very, very visible, helped us to uh, organize seminars, you know, joint lectures, uh, debates. Um, and share perspective with uh, faculty and colleagues from really different continents. And it wouldn't have happened without online. So now, even if the online is not the only way, we have a choice. Still, as this seminar shows, we still sometimes prefer an online conversation um, uh, because it's easier. Sometimes it's easier and, of course, cheaper. And I think this will remain. Of course, the networking and a direct contact, it cannot be replaced with anything. It's it's the best we can have, but sometimes uh, it's better to, to communicate online. So uh, that's also a, a big achievement. And third, uh, the war, of course, um, is a, <laughs> uh, it's a big issue. It's a big problem. But it can be also seen from the positive point of view. Um, Milan mentioned um, negative consequences, but... Um, we have um, also um, positive consequences of that. For example, in case of Poland, Romania, Baltic states, and all the Eastern flank, or like we say, Eastern front of the West at the border with Russia, um, we have many more interactions with Ukrainians. Uh, we have uh, mobilization, massive mobilization of our resources and people and human capital. Everybody contributes to that. And the societies, it's, it's very, it's like team building, you know, it's, it's very mobilizing and it shows the best of us, which is again, a very good case um, when you look at Poland. Um, so uh, I think, um, we are now closer to each other and the war helped, for example, uh, us to eliminate many issues, for example, with Ukraine. Um, our history is full of beautiful, but also difficult uh, moments. And now really this kind of a brotherhood between Ukrainians and Poles. And this is very much the case also uh, in case of Lithuania, for example. Um, it, it's the most important thing because maybe we understand the situation uh, better. We have the, sen the same sensitivity. We have the same reactions. The other positive thing is that it brought our region into the spot all over the world, especially Ukraine, which was an unknown country. I think many people from Latin America or Africa or Asia would not even know where the Ukraine is or was. Now everybody knows. And now really Ukraine has its mom moment momentum. And I think the whole region of Central Eastern Europe, but also the Baltics and Balkans are now very much uh, looked at, which can bring us to better understanding and to higher interest in this region. And I think which is very good because I don't think there is enough knowledge. Um, forget the war, I'm talking generally, there is not enough knowledge uh, in Western Europe, but I, so, I also think in the UK or the US about our region per se. So that's our momentum, and I, I just hope we will use it um, use it well. And the last thing I would say is that um, looking at the future, I think it will be many more initiatives um, from the U.S. side, from the U.K. side, but also countries like Japan, South Korea, so all the Western world to rebuild Ukraine. It means also to you know implement projects and academic cooperation, and you know offering different programs, help and whatever we can to the Ukrainians, first of all, but generally speaking to uh, the, the region in order to uh, balance better, maybe, you know, the European Union in the future and generally Europe. And I strongly believe that uh, the US and the UK and other countries, uh, which are very active in the Fulbright uh, program as well by academic cooperation, can uh, really contribute to this uh, huge chance our region has is facing.
Wonderful. Uh, who would like to go next? I would suggest Rika uh for the Hungarian perspective on this issue. Yeah, no, not a Hungarian perspective, if I may, because I left government service and I would like no, to say I, did, I didn't mean a Hungarian. Yeah. I didn't mean a Hungarian government perspective. Okay, good, good. <laughs> no, 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 that that was not the intent. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah, just as a disclaimer, of course, I'm only expressing my own personal and individual insights sites and not representing anybody's or any institutions or any government's perspective um but i have the disclaimer disclaimer has been recognized <laughs> <laughs> thank you but i have been working in security policy and strategic issues since 1990 and as uh, in the region of central eastern europe and worked a lot on regional issues regional cooperation from the visegrad cooperation to a number of other initiatives that we have had and um, as an observer of this um, troubled and, and, and strategic part of the uh, um, of the world, I think um, we uh, and also I had a Fulbright Fellowship, of course, back in the early '90s uh, to study strategic studies in the United States. Um, so all of this, I think, really um, um, helped me have a, a focus in our discussion also on you know what can make us as Fulbright Association uh, focused on, on developing the tools and the, uh, the proper policy responses to the challenges of our times. And as such, if I may say, you know, in addition to um, um, the wonderful work that, that the, um, the Fulbright Association has been, has been doing and Fulbright fellowships as such have been providing to, you know, tens of thousands of people all around the world. I think, you know, today's big crisis, which Manfred, congratulations for this topic and for this discussion to, to think of it and, and invite us together. Um, they really um, focus us on, so what is it? What are these, these big challenges that we really have to sort of put in the, in the uh, uh, center of our activities? And I think, you know, you rightly identified, you know, on one hand, the pandemic, and the uh, uh, that kind of a global crisis that it in in it launched practically, um, I think it is very um, clearly understood among experts that this was the first global pandemic, but certainly not the last one. And we may have similar uh, health threats, which may result even worse situations or even more difficult ones. So we certainly have had to realize that this is a, one of the big challenges of the 21st century. Another uh, big one is being uh, put forward by uh, Russia's aggressive uh, and barbaric attack on Ukraine um, against you know, the sovereignty of a, of a neighboring state. And uh, what I would like to um, ask to sort of focus on is to, on, on these, if we see these two big challenges as the big, you know, kind of some of the big questions of our times. Um, I, I think, you know, this is a time now to make a Fulbright more focused on these uh, um, challenges. So what I would like to recommend or I would, what I would like to see is to have our focus on, for instance, two or three, I mean, we may add someone added in the, in the discussion, live discussion this morning, you know, climate change. Yes, certainly, I think that is a very, uh, fundamental, you know, um, you know, pressure of our times, but to focus our support for developing a body of experts, of people who have dealt with these issues, who have been immersed in this, so to offer even, you know, a certain uh, percentage of fellowships spe specified for, on one hand, you know, global pandemics from the medical field to management to, um, uh, international cooperation, the role of international organizations or international documents. From a legal perspective, the medical perspective, there's a number of issues in which we need um, an international body of experts, you know, who have, who, who are prepared to handle such a crisis and who are ready to cooperate. And on the other hand, you know, to have an, um, a much better, much deeper understanding of the strategic challenges. So I would like to have an, another, you know, set percentage of our fellowships go to to training people in international studies international relations in strategic issues in security uh, studies 
because we need that. We need to have a solid understanding of the of the uh, strategic challenges and our values mm -hmm. on on democ on our democracies and our um, rules based uh, international and national orders. Um, and we need expertise in these fields. So I would like to propose, you know, that we focus our attention on training those people more, you know, in a sort of <laughs> more focused way um, who are in working or interested in these fields anyways, uh, but who will then be able to start to think very strategically about our common responses to the, uh, to the big challenges of our times. So fundamentally, I think this is what um would make uh, us as uh, as fulbright providers and fulbright as a as a program more um more focused more responsive to the challenges of the times ahead of us uh absolutely relevant to all of our countries and to all of our um you know priorities concerns um and something that has to be done urgently so i think um that is an immediate task that we should face. And then we could develop, you know, in addition to some, you know, some of these strategic or content uh, based proposals, we could develop new tools as well that could enhance these, which are proper to our times again. We have learned, as Margot Jaka said that, and also Milan, you know, uh, emphasized this, how quickly, you know, the educational systems had to adapt to the uh, online world and how wonderfully most of our countries really perform in this despite all the uh, the uh, the difficulties and the challenges i think along the same lines maybe we could think innovatively and say we can offer fulbright online fellowships and uh, reach out, uh, offer this possibility to professors who cannot travel to to another country but we're willing to give their time uh, who, um, to offer these kind of you know sort of focus areas or or specialization areas um, as courses a co uh, in a certain period of time or targeted to certain countries or um, parts of the world to enhance this uh, strategic, uh, international strategic thinking um, that will enable us to develop the right policy answers to uh, these challenges in the world. Okay, so thanks again for this discussion, Manfred, and this is a really wonderful opportunity to have these great uh, participants discuss this. Thank you. This morning, you also had some very, I think, germane and interesting comments about the focus on international security studies between Eastern Europe and Western Europe, uh, which were quite different before the war began. Uh, would you want to amplify, amplify on that? Oh, certainly. So I think one of the um, uh, characteristic phenomenon of, of, uh, of the last you know, 20, 30 years since the end of the Cold War has been um, a growing gap of, of uh, understanding between, um, I would say, you know, the two sides of the European continent, the uh, new member states who joined uh, the European Union after 1990, the older and the older ones, and even, um, or uh, similarly, among on the two sides of the Atlantic, between the Europeans and the US, uh, on uh, uh, on strategic issues and what I have seen as part and parcel of these discussions you know really taking part in in these discussions for the last three decades is a growing mm. misunderstanding a growing gap of of uh, of understanding of you know what these strategic challenges are and I think this is a real problem if we don't see the same uh, uh, if we don't deal with this uh, with these issues if we don't use the same language uh, we will not be able to develop common answers. So I think it's very important to bridge this strategic gap to really start a very intensive dialogue in Europe between uh, the Eastern side and the, um, as Margot Jaka said, the uh, Eastern front uh, of the, uh, both the European Union and of NATO really, uh, and the Western part of the continent. We have seen some very positive signs in this direction. I think some senior leaders have uh, pronounce these messages mo more recently, but we're not there yet. So they, uh, we have heard, you know, from senior German um, political decision makers recently that they should have listened, you know, to representatives of uh, of uh, the Central European countries more, you know, in the last decade or so when they were talking about, you know, what Russian foreign policy is, you know, heading towards. 
Um, but we're not there yet. And I think uh, certainly it is a very important task in the transatlantic arena as well to have a much deeper strategic discussion between Washington and the US and the European side. We are uh, in a position in which I think, unfortunately, the body of, of experts who deal with transatlantic or strategic you know, challenges in Europe is much, much narrower, much weaker, uh, much less numerous than uh, it should be. And obviously what we are seeing, you know, is a number of strategic pressures on our value systems and on our international organizations coming up. So we need to be able to act together to be, and for, for, act, for this, we need to be able to, you know, develop strategic discussions. So I believe that the, um, this, Div uh, this uh, gap that is dividing us uh, has to be bridged. And for this, we need uh, a, a serious number of experts uh, in strategic issues, which Fulbright can very easily uh, contribute to. It reminds me that there are other programs such as the Boren program, which is runs by the US security services uh, to train people in languages and so forth, might be also able to help. Uh, who would like to go next? Mary Ellen, would you like to go to, or Milan, would you like to comment on what you just heard? Um, how would, how, what's our, what's our preference? Am I on or am I on? Mute? You are on, yes. On, okay. On. okay. <laughs> you chose to be on first. You picked first. Thank you. Well, one of the things that I bring to this discussion is, as an American, is an extraordinary interest in the world and uh, with an interest that has shown itself in choosing to teach or travel with work as much as I can in the world, and often to places that are not the great capitals, so to speak, but, but to learn about places and their history and their culture, and to supplement my own reading as a scholar. Uh, for an example, when I was in college a very long time ago, taking a minor in history, Western Civ didn't include any of the Eastern Bloc nations because you didn't want to learn about them because after all, they were under Russia and or under the Soviet Union, pardon me, under the USSR. And you didn't learn about Turkey or anything about the Middle East because even though you've got, you know, the east-west access really right in Turkey, um, that was not part of Western Civ, except insofar as the Crusaders went to, you know, save, <laughs> save Turkey, and they ruined it, of course, and it became Islam almost immediately upon uh, the, the Crusades going there, and, um, you know, th so you've None of that was part of the curriculum, none at all. So my life as a scholar has been to try to, to fill in the understanding of Europe writ large uh, that simply wasn't part of a curriculum in the late 50s. Um, and uh, it has meant work in a lot of places that have been fascinating, like North Macedonia uh, uh, and Kosovo and working on a travel program with the Fulbright Association, taking us to Albania and Serbia and, and teaching in Kosovo and, and teaching actually teaching for the University of Maryland Global Campus in Turkey more than once down in Injerlik. So um, I found opportunities to do that learning. Now, what do I do with all that? Well, my second career has been teaching in an online setting for the University of Maryland Global Campus where I have military students who serve all over the world and others who are not traditional 18 to 22 year old students, but are students who come with sometimes with GEDs, that is a, a graduate of high school equivalent, and but with a and sometimes with a good degree from a good high school, a private school, a, an elegant school in, in a metropolitan area or who knows what. But the fact is they all come as adults who need to learn and whose lives of learning are wedged in between service commitments and, and so on in the rest of their lives with families and everything else. So what happens? You have to move to a new model of teaching and learning, which is really called adult learning theory. And 
adult learning theory is perfect for the kind of thing we need to accomplish in a world where we can't always travel to Poland or, or Ukraine for sure or anywhere else. But it turns the system of teaching into the topics being there and asking for genuine good discussion as we are here of what each person brings to the question. And there is enormous power in what I might even call a reading group writ large for people who are interested strategically in solving some of the problems of the world. You, you move the question and ask people to bring what they know, what they've learned, what they've experienced that will play into the question in order to find solutions. And it can be very powerful and it can create a much richer understanding and creative exchange than having prepared papers can. Thank you. Uh, so Milan, would you like to go next? You, you have, you've heard a lot of things, three speakers, you probably have some comments uh, and opinions. Uh, let's, let's see where yeah, we so go. I would want to go back to the point that I tried to <laughs> unsuccessfully, I think, make in the previous discussion when we had technical problems, which is that I think part of the reason um, that the full, at least according to my research, that's of course my opinion, that the Fulbright influence is weakening is the vital issue of funding. Of course, nobody wants to talk about it because nobody wants to spend money. But if we compare, let's say, Fulbright and Erasmus, I did, did just check that today. Erasmus has a, a yearly budget of 3.9 billion euros. So with the euro being now in parity with the dollar is basically uh, 3.9 billion dollars, while Fulbright has only a budget of about 250 million. So Erasmus, and I think as one of the previous speakers said, in Erasmus, the amount sp spent per student is lower than um, in uh, Fulbright. But that's of course understandable because Fulbright scholars are sent to a much, uh, you know, uh, for, for a much more distant journey than, than the Erasmus ones. But basically, uh, if, if we want to create uh, far reaching exchange programs that change minds of people, that shape their opinions, we have to provide funding. The more funding we provide, the more people we send, the more chance we get that, uh, you know, the person will ultimately become an influential scholar, politician, professor, mm. and so on and so forth. Mm. Um, and I think there is a sense among the younger generation that is, is different from, from the one that my parents and my grandparents have, that the United States is far more distant among my peers, uh, there's few people who have ever been to North America uh, and especially to, to the United States. Uh, and the, these the, much fewer than in the generation of my parents, where, when some person, when almost, I, I would say a big chunk of them came because they had uh, friends or family or acquaintances living somewhere in Brooklyn. So I think there's a correlation between, you know, the exchange programs getting less funding or at least less funding relative to the exchange programs that uh, became available for Polish people after 2004, after we uh, joined the European Union, uh, a correlation between uh, immigration to the United States from Eastern Europe and from Europe in general being much lower than it was ever historically. And uh, as uh, Rika mentioned, a sense, a sense of like growing divide in thinking, for example, about strategic issues between Europe and the United States. Um, I think cultural exchange in every form, doesn't matter academical or uh, in any other fashion, uh, is what, you know, bonds our minds closer together. And if we don't provide the funding and don't provide the opportunities and create barriers as often uh, is the case with the US for people to come in, we basically sentence ourselves ourselves for separation and a lack of understanding. Thank you. Uh, your comments remind me of a part of my later childhood, which was in Pittsburgh, where the Polish community was very prominent. These were people who had left mm -hmm. Poland within my lifetime and earlier, and they were a huge part of the social fabric of the city. 
and of other cities nearby. And that's certainly become less. Uh, and you, I think you've touched on that. In terms of Erasmus, I think you're right in terms of the budget. Uh, DAD, which I tried to bring into this discussion, uh, also has a larger budget than Fulbright does. And uh, even though it comes and it comes from a European perspective, a different perspective that that well, perspective that I tried to bring in here, which we will still try to bring in with um, Ben Brish, they've also come. His comments this morning suggested that they've also concentrated on using technology <clears throat> increasingly in the face of the pandemic uh, to and uh, including visiting uh, scholars' positions as we've proposed for Fulbright. Um, they're all they're already doing that. Um, so, but I've spoken enough. Um, Mal Grisada, have you further comments? Would you like? Well, to if I may jump in, uh, as we discussed it in the morning, um, uh, I mentioned this uh, Erasmus idea as a key. Why? Because Erasmus is a really excellent, maybe one of the best ideas uh, European Union implemented in education, because it really brings us closer. We have 27 now member states and, you know, thanks to Erasmus, both the students and faculty uh, do things together, travel, meet, spend semester with one year mm -hmm. and at the other university. And these initiatives will grow. Mm -hmm. Just this year, it's the first ever bachelor launch in European studies jointly by 10 universities in, in the EU. It's never happened before. So... It will be this European university idea, by the way, launched by uh, Macron in his speech in, at Sorbonne University. So it will be this direction, you know, that the, thanks to Erasmus, of course, money is very important, but the idea is key, you know, and then political will to allocate this money. Comparing to the US, EU relationship, we don't really have any massive attention on education. And what we lost is we lost this feeling of being together because earlier it was the Second World War which brought us together, a generation, you know, of my grandparents. They were fighting together. So this was really a formation moment, right? Then their children had knowledge from the parents and they wanted to have this um, uh, interaction, but this was a world divided into two. During the Cold War, Eastern Bloc uh, was there, so we were not a part of this exchange. The Western Europeans were, and the transatlantic relations were very strong because of the security, because there was a Soviet Union, so Americans were protecting Europe, and that, that was the obvious reason why these countries, I mean, these regions cooperated. After 1991, when Soviet Union collapsed, the paradox happened that, you know, the whole attention in the Eastern, um, Central Eastern European countries went towards the European Union, of course, because we wanted to join EU and NATO. Then Western Europe and Eastern Europe, you know, jointly created a European Union enlarged by Poland, Hungary and many other countries. And sometime in the middle of these processes, the U.S., was going a different path towards more Asia, towards, and in the meantime, the US society also transformed from within. It's a very different United States that, you know, in the times of the Second World War. So somehow we risk now, after these 30 years uh, when uh, the Cold War finished, that the Europeans will be closer and closer, despite the difficulties, despite all the quarrels we have, and the war in Ukraine brings us even closer. And with the Americans, now we have to decide because um, it can be closer, that's the momentum, or it can be, you know, a separation. Depends a lot how we play further. The war in Ukraine, Russian um, thing, also what will be the situation internally in the UN, United States, who will be the president and what will be the political situation. And also Europe, in this regard, will decide about strategic autonomy, which doesn't help to build these uh, close relations. So I think the recommendation would be, maybe for the Fulbright as well, as a program to create this kind of a special path, special attention towards education between the US and the EU, or largely US, UK, EU, and create that maybe something new, or maybe within Fulbright, and maybe something with Fulbright can 
uh, contribute as an idea to create this kind of an exchange program when, if there is a will, the EU will allocate money and the US government will allocate money. It has to be just a, a very clear idea. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Rika, do you have any comments? Uh, this is an interesting discussion. Uh, would you like to continue this? Thank you. Yeah, it is a very interesting discussion and very <clears throat> important to see that we're really on the same page on this. I think I do agree with the um, importance of refocusing on, on transatlantic exchanges um, because we had a fantastic experience in this in the early 1990s. You know, right after the end of the Cold War, the number of exchanges and programs and possibilities to meet on the two sides of the Atlantic was, you know, spectacular and uh, a real uh, transatlantic you know expert team grew up in this and was forged practically in this in these meetings in these conferences and events and trainings and workshops and you name it um which are done so now we're in the in the uh, after you know the last uh, 10 years we're in a situation that we we don't have um, um, the same intensity of of uh, possibilities to meet between for the the younger generation between the two sides of the. So if we let this process continue, if we let if we don't stop this and reverse this trend, um, then you know we practically uh, end the uh, serious transatlantic cooperation in the long term. So I think it is a very very important moment to refocus on relaunching these, these, this network um, and take the example of the Erasmus program, take the examples of the early 90s then when we were uh, having these events and these programs together and, uh, and re refocus on them. So absolutely very happy to have this discussion. And they need to be, they need to be strategic connections. One of the respondents this morning talked about issues that hold us all. Am I on? Am I You're on. You're definitely on. <laughs> okay. We need to be focused strategically on issues that can and must bring us together. Climate change for one, and not just climate change and the, uh, the weather issues that go along with it, but the food and the health issues that go along with it. One of our colleagues this morning spoke of toxicology. He's written hundreds of papers on, on the forever poisons, which are coming back to haunt us as the permafrost melts. Um, there is a huge opportunity to think together about solutions to things that are going to cross boundaries, whether we're in the Atlantic community or in Asia or anything else. And, and we don't have a lot of time to do that. Uh, this is something that is with us right now. So the strategic part of it is not just to say, oh, we get, need to get to know each other again. We need to understand each other's backgrounds and our cultures and so on. It is now, what must we do as a global community to, to keep the globe a livable place that solves some of its major problems. Um, so I think working strategically with issues, and then as I suggested before, we can't have everybody always getting together, but we can use technology more than we ever could for meetings like this to share ideas over strategic issues. And that's not the whole thing. I just love to sit in a room talking with each of us one-on-one -on -one or in our small group. That's the real joy of it all. And ideas can flow in all kinds of ways. But more and more, the online setup, if it's done well, can facilitate that happening in a very purposeful way. Absolutely. Milan, you have your hand raised. Why don't you unmute and... Sure. So I also wanted to mention, and uh, Mrs. Schmieder, uh, the speech actually reminded me of that. that I'm sorry? Uh, your, your speech uh, kind of brought that idea into my mind that I, I always had, that the war, in, the war in Ukraine also shows us, I think, that uh, a bigger focus and more resources and more political attention towards Europe uh, is pretty much justified. If we uh, see on the map of the globe, which countries uh, have uh, behaved 
uh, you know, in line with Western civilization on the issue of Ukraine, we see that uh, North America, Europe, Australia, um, Japan are very much in line that we have a common mentality, while countries such as, let's say, India or in the Middle East, which the US invested uh, money on uh, to do cultural exchanges and to bring them closer together, like I, I think we are all aware that India has been the source of greatest immigration into the United States for a number of years, they have shown to have a different mentality. They didn't put the issue of Ukraine, you know, in front of their political and economic interest. Um, so I would say that this crisis also shows us that there is more that ties together Europe and the United States than these other countries. So we should re redirect more resources to have greater economic exchange, greater immigration in both directions. I think it's really important because we are on the same page while other countries are not always on the same page with us. So let's support each other if we believe in, we, if we have similar value systems. I would, I would only differ with you that I don't think it's mentality, but there, is national, there are national interests at stake. India is in a very difficult geopolitical situation between Pakistan and China. Yeah. And uh, they are, it's not so much mentality as their situation is quite radically different they have to they are they feel that they are being forced to follow their own situation um but but I, your point is well taken mary ellen would you like to summarize uh would you like to complete this discussion i think that was your your natural role in the first seg in the first segment well uh first of all i want to say how grateful i am to all of you for giving this time and careful thought to this question and to being open about some of the real issues that are uh, playing in the world. I think it's the kind of thing that uh, those of us who are Americans uh, need to hear that, um, oh, here we are thinking we're doing a good thing because we're really leading the way, at least from our media perspective, in assisting in pulling the world together behind the Ukrainian uh, attempt at democracy and at keeping its nation alive. But we don't have the depth of the other part of that. And that is uh, what that means in the whole community of Europe and the world. Um, and we need not to be satisfied that just because um, we are trying to regain a place in the discussion that we did not have for a few years. I mean, I think the the, uh, the Fulbright Association's own role in, for example, honoring Angela Merkel three years ago, whose speech was all about the importance of NATO, the importance of relationships, of understanding one another, and of traveling and meeting and, and knowing one another. And it was at a time when it was almost a Jeremiah. It was almost a time of you know, last gasp, and there seems to be a new moment caused by difficulty, war and pandemic, but it is a moment that can be a very good one for people of goodwill if we can seize it and make it work. Thank and with you. new tools to do it and yep. new interest in doing it. Thank you. Uh, Malgrazada, Rita, Rika, would you like to make some final comments before we go? Either of you, you don't have to. I guess not. I don't hear from either of you. Can you know, you... Manfred, I would say one other thing that is important yes. here. Uh, here, um, that whole idea of the generations, the yeah. generations that grew up after, the, after World War II and became adults and got into the world when it seemed a brave new world, although the, the uh, East-West conundrum was there. But then when the wall fell and everything seemed better, enormous energy and uh, people who are mature and ready to do some things. And there's a whole generational shift now, literally by the fact of how long people have lived and can no longer be active in that, uh, basically me included. And um, how, how one reinvests that interest and excitement actually a challenge, living through challenges and wanting that kind of an engaged life. I think 
I mean, when I look at, you know, our, our leadership in this country, our president and our, our head of the House of Representatives are both 80 year olds. And I mean, that shows again, the kind of shift that has got to come to another generation that needs to be engaged, needs to know why to be engaged and needs to understand how to be engaged from the Congress on down. Well, with that note, saying that, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'd like to conclude this. Every every good thing has to have an end, and this is certainly a good thing. I'd like to thank uh, you, Mary Ellen, you, Milan, Reka, Malgrazada, for a wonderful discussion. We're going to get try to incorporate Ben Brush's uh, part portion into this set when this goes out, if we can. And uh, thank you again. Uh, it's really been wonderful. Thank you, Manfred. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. Well, first, I'd like to thank uh, Milan and Mary Ellen, Erika, and Mel Grisada for their wonderful contributions just a moment ago. At this point, we're going to move forward to hearing a contribution by Benedict Brisch. Uh, Benedict Brisch uh, is the director of the German Center for Research Innovation and Innovation in New York and the director of the German Academic Exchange Service Office for North America. He's been doing this since 2019. Uh, he's been this this obviously that was just before the pandemic began, uh, but he's been doing this for a while. In 1998, he coordinated a scholarship program for Russian graduates in Germany funded by German industry. Uh, he was deputy director of the DAD regional office in Moscow from 2000 to 2004, uh, and af from 2005 to 14, responsible for academic exchanges uh, funded by the German government between Germany, Eastern Europe, and Central Asia. Uh, after 2015, he was uh, head of the Division of Scholarships for DAD in, in Europe and North America, uh, based in Bonn. So Benedict has a lot to say about the topics we've been discussing today, and I'm certainly looked forward forward to hearing it, and I'm sure you do too. So take it away, Ben. Dear friends of International Academic Exchange, it is an honor and my pleasure to introduce to you some aspects of the work of the German Academic Exchange Service, the DAD, in a time of pandemic and war. My name is Ben Brisch. I'm the director of the DED North America Regional Office in New York City. And I will start today with the DED paper, Foreign Science Policy for a Multipolar World, published in the summer, 22. And then I'll introduce three DED funding schemes to you. I'll start with Ukraine Digital, ensuring academic success in times of crisis. Then we'll come to International Virtual Academic Collaboration, the IVAC program. And last but not least, I will introduce to you the Hilde Domin Scholarship Program for students and doctoral candidates at risk. So, as I said, I'll start with the DED paper, Foreign Science Policy for a Multipolar World. This paper was published by DED this summer in the year 22. And um, one can say that this is a paper about science diplomacy, German science diplomacy or German foreign science policy. Um, and why is this relevant uh, in particular in the year 22? Of course, organizations like the DAD, other international partner organizations are considered um, stakeholders or um, institutions that participate and uh, play a role in international science diplomacy. That was always the case, but this year in the year 22, we are challenged by the turning point, as we call it in Germany, of the 24th of uh, February, when the Russian war of aggression against Ukraine started. So the translation of the word turning point in Germany, very common is to use the phrase Zeitenwende. You might have heard that coined by the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz. And um, this Zeitenwende or turning point um, 
means that we are today challenged by a new dimension of conflict in the world by this aggression uh, in Europe against uh, a democratic European country, Ukraine. But this also is gives us reason to reflect on our position on conflict and international relations um, on a global level, because this is now a tragedy, um, a war in Ukraine that is uh, really um, an all causes an awful situation uh, in Ukraine. But we have seen war, oppression, um, violence all over the world, and the science community must reflect on that and um, think about how we can act as scientists and uh, international science organizations. So our paper produced by DED, I don't want to summarize it um, here, but I want to present five principles that are mentioned in this paper. Uh, these principles for further for the further development of German science diplomacy include a value-based, a responsibility-oriented, interest-driven, regionally differentiated, and a risk-reflective foreign science policy. What does that mean? Of course, our actions were always value-based. Among the values are human rights, prosperity and freedom of the nations, development, freedom of speech. But of course, uh, these values are challenged now, but there is also a conflict within these principles. If you take the first two ones, value-based and responsibility-oriented foreign science policy. For Let me give you an example. If a country um, violate, violates our values of peace, of human rights, for example, we might say that we would want to cut ties with this country and with this society. But that's, that causes the next pro problem. Uh, if we want to have a responsibility-oriented um, foreign science policy, we have to see that in countries that are causing aggression or where violence is happening, um, students and scientists might not agree with their governments and they would desperately uh, want to be in contact with the international science community. And we can't really reject that. On It's on the contrary important to continue to have ties into countries and societies uh, even under very problematic circumstances, because we want to, we need to build a future that is, um, will be created a future after war, after violence, where we want to live together peacefully in a constructive way. So this paper published by DED offers uh, these principles as a debate, and we believe it's important for the international science community to have these discussions. And we're experiencing a lot of questions by the international um, science community, and we believe it's important that organizations like DED and our respective partners participate in these debates. Let me now come to one of our new funding schemes. This is Ukraine Digital, ensuring, ensuring academic success in times of crisis. So uh, after uh, Russia's attack against Ukraine, as we have seen, a lot of Ukrainian citizens had to flee the country, of course. They looked for protection and shelter in neighboring countries like Poland, like Germany, and many, many other countries in Europe. Until now, we have around 1 million refugees in Germany from coming from Ukraine, and many of them are coming from universities. Many of them are students, professors, researchers who fled the war. And we do not only want to protect them and give them shelter in Germany, but we want to support them in continuing their work. And with the funding program Ukraine Digital, we are able to support 
Ukrainian higher education institutions in maintaining, implementing, and offering their virtual courses. Ukrainian students have the prospect of completing their study, studies despite the limitations caused by the war. And it's also important to see that this program is considered um, as a program that helps Ukraine to integrate into the European higher education and research area. If you want to know more about Ukraine Digital, uh, please look it up, Google it. You will find it, of course, on the internet. And let me now come to one more um, DED funding program. Um, now I'd like to introduce to you the DED funding program, International Virtual Academic Collaboration. And this program can clearly be seen as an answer to the pandemic. So in the year 2020, when the pandemic started, international mobility of students and uh, researchers was interrupted. Unfortunately, people couldn't uh, travel anymore. And we were thinking, what can we do to um, to support continuation of international uh, academic collaboration? And we came up with the uh, International Virtual Academic Collaboration, the IVEC program. Um, this program integrates virtual collaboration formats in the curriculum of the participating universities. It offers international experiences and digital and international skill training for participating students. We also believe that uh, virtual um, study abroad opportunities are supporting diversity because many students, in particular underprivileged groups, do not have the resources for international exchange in person. So this program allows for all participants to, um, to experience uh, study ab abroad, uh, abroad time in a joint classroom with a partner university abroad. And with the funding of the Federal Ministry of Education and Research, we were able to um, provide funding for 61 projects in the year 2020 already. We received 122 applications and uh, 61 um, partnerships of German universities with their respective international partners were funded through the IVEC program. We continued in 21 and uh, we're glad to be able to continue this virtual international uh, collaboration program uh, in the year 22 and 23 too. Let me now come to a third example of uh, international exchange in times of crisis and war. And this third example is now the Hilde Domin Scholarship Program for Students and Doctoral Candidates at Risk launched by DED in the year 2021 with funds from the Federal Foreign Office in Germany. So you might ask, where does the name Hilde Domin come from? On the right, you see a picture of Hilde Domin, who was a German Jewish writer, poet, and essayist. She had to flee Germany in the year 1932. Um, and she spent more than 20 years of her life in various countries. She couldn't come back to Germany, of course, for, for many years. Uh, and um, later she came back to Germany and became a renowned um, German author and writer. And as an example of um, a writer who had to flee Germany in the 20th century, we were able to give the her name to the scholarship program for students and doctoral candidates at risk. So this program um, offers support to students from across the globe who are at risk for be, of being formally or de facto denied educational or other rights, uh, rights in their country of origin. And this program provides these students the opportunity to begin or complete a study or research degree at a university in Germany. 
we already um, welcomed the first cohorts of this program in Germany, and we are happy that with the support from the Federal Foreign Office in Germany, we will continue this program. And we believe we will have in the future, we will see um, more and more alumni coming from, these, uh, from this program. Uh, students who fled the war in their countries and were able to receive education or participate in or do pursue their research projects in Germany. I want to add here that um, DED over the course of the last decades always welcomed refugees among their scholarship holders. Um, but this is the first um, uh, DED program that specifically um, addresses students at risks and invites them to Germany. So we believe this is a very important new step for Germany to invite people, students who fled um, war, violence and oppression, and we are able to support them in Germany. So this was the third program I'd I wanted to introduce to you. I'm coming to an end uh, here with this nice picture of the Apollo spaceship, spacecraft, uh, the, um, the picture of our planet from the year 1968. With this uh, picture, I'd like to end today's presentation. I thank for your attention and uh, please make sure to uh, know where to find us. You can look uh, up our internet uh, websites, ded.org and ded.de. You find uh, all of our information resources about the scholarship programs, the funding schemes there. I hope that's helpful to you. And um, please also sign up for our newsletter if you're interested so we can stay in touch. Thank you, bye-bye. Best wish wishes. Well, Ben, I really thank you for your thorough and comprehensive and really interesting presentation. Uh, I think that added a huge amount to our overall discussion here today. Um, I wish people ask, could ask you questions um, or that we that the format would allow you to participate in the discussion with the other participants. It's not to be, uh, but that's the way it is. Um, I, uh, but again, I think this is a huge contribution to the topic of scholarly exchange and its issues uh, during a time of pandemic and war. Uh, once again, thanks to you, Ben, to Milan, uh, Mary Ellen, Rika, Mal Grisada, uh, for a really interesting conversation. I think that will have a, it's a large contribution to this effect. Also, uh, while there are signs that the pandemic is coming to an end, um, there are unfortunately no signs that the war is coming to end at this point. Um, and we certainly all hope that it will uh, as soon as possible. Um, the wars all do always do end, but the sooner the better and the fewer lives lost, the better. And we can go back to peaceful, peaceful international student and scholarly exchange. Okay. I wish you all the best. Good evening.